together. I call it the inverse transposed and adjoint matrices. These are the constructs which appear often in, in the applications. Uh, and you know, you have to know the basic properties of these constructs. The inverse out of this free, so that's a free construct, inverse, transpose, and adjoint. We already started with you the inverse. You more or less have some understanding what it is. And defining the inverse is actually not an easy process. Uh, the other two, they are very, I mean, on the definition side, they are very easy. So what happens is this. If you, if you have a matrix, in principle, you, in, in general, you may have a rectangular matrix, not necessarily a square one. So you see my M and N may be different. Here's my entries. I will use the little a for the entries of my matrix. As an example, I just chose this matrix. That's the one we met once with you. If you don't remember, you probably will remember better if I tell you this one is one identity, I mean identity. We use the bold face for the identity, identity of size three, plus the, remember this N matrix, or in fact, I N matrix. We had two slides which studied that matrix quite extensively, and there was plus I square N square. Oops, I square N square. That is the matrix, you, you, you will remember it better in this form because when we found the inverse for this matrix, we, exa we used exactly this form of that, this representation for this matrix. I chose this particular matrix because uh, we know what the inverse for this matrix is. I don't want to spend right now times on finding the inverses. That's why I chose this one as an example for demonstration. Now, the other two operations, transpose matrix, uh, that's the one which is, that's a symbol for that. You use the capital T as the superscript above the symbol of the matrix. Look at the sizing of that matrix. The sizing is opposite to this. And the entries of that matrix, look at this, you just flip the indices around. Rather than JK, you put them KJ. For instance, the transpose of this matrix, here it is. Every row here, Every row here went into the column here. First row, first column. Second row, second column. And so on. Or you can do it the other way. Every column here will go into the row here. That is, that is what we call the transpose or transposition of a matrix. Adjoint, adjoint. That's a symbol which is normally used for that. Rather than T, we put asterisk. Again, look at the sizing. That's how we define that. We flip the indices, so every column will go into the row again. But on the top of that, we take complex conjugation. You see this little bar? That's the complex conjugation. So for instance, the matrix A star for this example, here it is. It is like my transposed, but complex entries, they gained extra negative. Well, I have a third column here for the inverse. We know what the inverse is. In, you, you can only discuss inverses when you have a square matrix, so you have to equate this M and N if you discuss inverses. We know what the inverse for this matrix is, that it is. That is the inverse. We found this inverse in a, in a different form. We found it like this. If you remember, it was negative I think it was like this, yes. We spent quite a substantial amount of time finding the inverse. We used the geometric progression formula as a guiding, guiding idea how to find that inverse, if you remember. And that was the result. I just put this result here in the matrix form, that result. So the purpose of this slide is to give you some basic properties which, are con which connects these three constructs, uh, transposed, adjoint, and inverse. Here they are. Well, some basic ones, for instance, when you add two matrices and you take a transposition, this will be equivalent to taking the transposition to, of individual terms and then add them together. Similar goes true 
for adjoint. Nothing similar exists for the inverse, by the way. When you take the inverse of the sum, you cannot claim it's the sum of the inverses. Sometimes you won't be able, you won't be, uh, you won't be, able, shut up. <laughs> Sometimes the sum will not be even invertible, so you won't be able to claim that the sum is the invertible. <coughs> products, that's how the products or multiplication of matrices is connected with the transposed. Again, similar to the sum, but pay attention to the change of the order of the factors. Similar true for the adjoints, and surprisingly, similar is true for the inverses. Every time, you have to change the order of the factors, by the way. Pay attention to this. Double transposition. If you transpose the matrix once again, you will come up with the same matrix as you started. Double adjoint does the same. Surprisingly, double inverse does the same as well. Now, the interesting thing is, uh, well, the other property, actually, which is not so trivial, actually, I mean, these, these properties, these six, these six properties, they're absolutely elementary. If you try to prove them, it's a straightforward argument. For the inverses, it's a little bit more involved, but it resembles the argument I showed you once for the lemma, which we used in one of the tutorial questions. Uh, if you ask me to be more specific, uh, how can I say what was the lemma about? What was the lemma about? Uh, yeah, actually we, actually, we proved this in that lemma. Yeah, I remember it now. Just realized. We, we, this identity, I proved this identity in the lemma. And the similar argument will work here. Now, the one which is not so easy to prove is this one. That if you compute the determinant of the transpose matrix, this will be the same as the determinant of original matrix. What do you think will be the analogy of this for the adjoint matrices? That's right. Thank you. Given that the adjoint differs from transposition by taking an extra complex conjugation, it means that the determinant of the adjoint will be different from the original one by extra complex conjugation. This is not trivial. This is far from trivial, This proof of the proof of this result. We take it as granted because, uh, remember, I told you a few times, and I used it a few times already, when I can put the determinant, for instance, via minor method, I can do rows, I can do columns. And this freedom, it's exactly this identity. Because when you transpose a matrix, rows and columns, they change their rows. But why you can do that, why it is such a... Uh, why it happens that you do rows or you do columns and you miraculously come up with the same number, it's a very deep result, very non-trivial result. So this is very non-trivial identity, even though you will accept it easily and you will use it very often. But the, behind, the argument behind this is it, it's not, not an easy argument. Inverses and determinants all connected in a quite expectable way, even though it's another very non-trivial result. Well, everything connecting with the everything which re uh, relates to determinants is very non-trivial because the actual the way we compute the determinants is very complex, either via minus or via elementary row operations. This identity, by the way, gives you a very effective well, gives you another way of testing that the matrix is invertible. Right now, you have only one way to do that: you take a matrix. You may put next to it the identity, and, and then you start doing the row reduction until the left-hand side reaches the reduced row echelon form. And, when you, and then you examine that reduced row echelon form, and you see if it is identity, if you have all leading columns on the left-hand side, you conclude that the matrix is invertible. Here's another way. The matrix is invertible when the determinant of that matrix is not zero, because otherwise this doesn't make sense. You cannot take the inverse of the zero number. <coughs> 